I bid you welcome. I welcome you to my house. Welcome to my house. Welcome to my home. Hello horror hounds and welcome to my horror house and welcome back to another Monster Monday. I look back at the Godzilla franchise. We're at 1968 and a film called Destroy All Monsters. Set in the far-flung future of 1999, the United Nations Scientific Committee has established a base on the surface of the moon. There's also an underwater research centre at the heart of Monster Island to monitor the beasts who are now contained and peacefully inhabit the place. Suddenly, all communication is lost with Monster Island and monsters begin attacking major cities around the globe. Rodan hits Moscow, Gorosaurus attacks Paris, and Godzilla rocks up in New York Harbour. For reasons I can't fathom, apart from looking really cool, it's decided that the best way to launch a reconnaissance mission is to send in one of the space rockets from the moon base. We've got aliens again, and they're planning to colonise the Earth again. They're called the Kiriku, and this time they're using remote control technology to get the monsters to do their dirty work and lay the groundwork for their invasion. How much time have you got? I've mentioned Rodan and Godzilla. We also get Gorosaurus, who first appeared in Toho's King Kong Escapes, and he's basically a large dinosaur. Then we've got... Uh, Baragon, he's a background monster who first appeared in the 1965 film Frankenstein Conquers the World. He's also a dinosaur, but uh, the idea is that he burrowed underground when all the other dinosaurs became extinct and managed to survive and thrive there. Varan is another background monster, this time from the 1958 film Varan the Unbelievable. We get Manda, who first appeared in Toho's 1963 film Atragon, and he's sort of a huge Japanese-style dragon. Plus the return of fan favourites Mothra, Angulus, Ghidorah. We also get Manila and uh, Kumonga, the giant spider, both from Son of Godzilla, who pop up in the final battle. When the monsters start attacking cities around the world, we get snippets of footage like Rodan in Moscow, Gorosaurus burrowing up from underneath the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, uh, Godzilla torching the buildings in New York Harbour. 35 minutes in and Tokyo gets the attention of Rodan and Godzilla. Then Manda turns up and adds to the destruction. Everyone's in shelters by this point, so there are no fleeing people in these scenes of destruction. But as with many of the previous films, the attacks take place, to the movie's credit, in broad daylight. There's no gloomy nighttime rain-swept attacks, so you have to squint to see what's going on. Sure, that makes it clear that the models are models, but that's all part of the fun of these movies. The sets this time out are huge and amazingly detailed. Because of the sheer number of monsters on screen, there's also a depth of field to the destruction that we've never seen before. Manda is in the foreground destroying something. Rodan does a flyby in the midground, whilst Godzilla is far off in the background stomping buildings. It's a really impressive shot. Then the army lets fly with missiles, and then Mothra turns up. We've never seen so much monster action before. We're also treated to scenes of devastation and the aftermath of these attacks that we haven't really seen since 1954 and 1955 with Gojira and Godzilla raids again. Later the army takes on Godzilla again near Mount Fuji and Anguirus turns up to help him smash tanks. If you love these old monster movies, you will have a big grin on your face by now. And that's before Rodan gives an aerial chase to the space rocket from the moon base. Eventually, inevitably, the remote control that the Kiriku aliens have over these monsters is broken and the tide of the battle turns. Once these now free monsters turn their attention to the Kiriku, there are so many monsters on screen that I lost count. Some of them are background fare to be sure that don't engage, while others step to the forefront and take a more active role. But to my mind, it's a kaiju version of those X-Men or Marvel's Avengers double page 
spreads that have dozens and dozens of characters on that you spend ages poring over and just gazing at it. I can't believe they're all in the same shot together. This is insane. I'm sorry if this feels like a bit of a breathless and then, and then, and then review, but there is a momentum to this film once so many monsters start appearing on the screen and then Ghidorah turns up. Being a space alien himself, I guess that's why he's on the side of the aliens, but he turns up to try and help the Kiriku, and then it's a huge monster mash, a royal rumble. At this point, subtlety is just a word in the dictionary. As the film opened with a rocket taking off for the moon, I breathed a sigh of relief that we weren't going to be tethered to another island location as we have been in the previous two movies. Anyone who's watched Pacific Rim will already know that Guillermo del Toro has a deep and abiding love for these old kaiju movies. And I'm tickled to see that the first wave of his alien invasion plan is essentially a reskinned version of the alien plan from this movie, sending loads and loads of giant monsters to pound the species into submission. Then we can come in, mop up and take over. It's another groovy sci-fi tale like Invasion of Astro Monster with space rockets, ray guns, alien invaders, moon bases and mind control. The monsters may be pawns in a grander plan, but they are placed more centrally here than they were in Invasion of Astro Monster. Surely by now Godzilla has been fully rehabilitated. Here it's his tenacious nature that eventually wins the day for Earth. Without that grumpy old sod, all would be lost. So I guess three cheers for Godzilla, King of the Monsters.